The following is a special presentation of Mole Star Communications. Welcome, and welcome to a celebration of excellence, the story of the Toronto Maple Leafs, 1992-93. For almost a quarter of a century, hard-suffering Maple Leaf fans had dreamt about a season just like this one. Their patience and loyalty were paid back by a group of men who called this dressing room their home from September right through to the end of May. It was an unbelievable ride, a ride of great accomplishment and great performances. Over the next hour or so, we're going to treat you to some of the memories of this great season. The Leafs, 1992-93. Excellence, it certainly was. The biggest positive factor that came out of this whole season is that uh, we've developed as a team. Uh, Pat Burns has done an excellent job and the players became believers and the players like winning a lot more than they like the other side of it. Creating an atmosphere for success, it's a Cliff Fletcher trademark. The Maple Leaf president shoulders the responsibility of this massive hockey reconstruction. With Fletcher, Toronto got what it needed most, a firm, stable hand at the top, providing unparalleled stewardship. His hockey savvy has put the Leafs at the very forefront of pro hockey. Montreal-born, Fletcher learned the ropes there and in St. Louis with the Blues in the late 60s. His impression was such that when the Flames needed a young mind to run things in Atlanta, they turned to Fletcher. After almost two decades as a contender, Fletcher's dream of a Stanley Cup came to fruition in 1989 as his Flames of Calgary won the ultimate prize. In June 1991, then-President Donald Giffen woos him to Toronto. Fletcher is exactly the tonic the Leafs needed to set a course for prosperity. In order to get the type of job done that has to be done so that all Torontonians and hockey fans and shareholders can be proud, then the person at the top has to have the flexibility to formulate policy and make the decisions necessary that have to be made. But the first thing that he did that was so lacking around this building and, and this hockey team was he brought a measure of respect, credibility, and class back to this organization. Cliff has produced an environment that's conducive to winning. It allows a player to concentrate on what he has to do to be a better player and not have to worry about whether it's going to be screwed up at the upper level. Put into motion by Fletcher and Gardens chairman Steve Stavro, the master plan included items like the welcome mat being rolled out for former Leaf stars like Ted Kennedy. The organization also decided it was time to honor many of those who wore the blue and white with distinction. Ceremonies respecting the contributions of greats Ace Bailey and Bill Barocco brought respect back to the sweater. You never see one of our jerseys on the ground. Our jerseys are either hung up or on someone's back. And uh, we carry that feeling on the ice. If any one of our players ever got knocked down, they'd be right back up and working twice as hard. On the ice in year one, Fletcher made bold moves, acquiring future Hall of Famers Grant Fuhrer and Doug Gilmore within four months. Year two, the agenda includes securing Pat Burns as head coach, sniper Dave Andrichuk to compliment Gilmore, and the promotion of rookie goaltender Felix Potvin. All moves with a distinct purpose in mind. 
It's something where he's earned respect uh, through experience over a lot of years of, of being a general manager of a hockey team. And anytime a person like Cliff Fletcher can come in and take over a hockey club, you're going to have instant respect because of his past track record. Nobody's, I don't think anyone's made that impact in the Toronto sports scene ever that Cliff Fletcher's made with the Toronto Maple Leafs in two years, considering what he was up against. May 29th, 1992, and Cliff Fletcher and the Toronto Maple Leafs shocked the hockey world. They named Pat Burns as the 22nd coach in Maple Leaf history. The former bench boss of the Montreal Canadiens brings a no-nonsense approach to the game to this dressing room. He demands a better work ethic of everyone involved. And he brings with him a slogan, a slogan that this team would live by game in and game out. Don't just play, compete. He brought instant credibility to our team when he arrived in the scene here in Toronto. Hockey is, is almost like a play. They're, they're the actors and I'm just the director. I don't think you can underestimate the job that Pat Burns did with this hockey team when you consider that most people didn't think that they were even a playoff team at the beginning of the year. If you're not prepared to work in practice or in a game, you're not going to play. One of Pat's coaching traits is when he's really mad to smile on the bench. January 2nd, 1992. That's a date that should be chiseled into the cornerstone of this franchise. It's the day that Cliff Fletcher stole Doug Gilmore from the Calgary Flames. In his first full year in a Maple Leaf uniform, Gilmore would set new club records for points and assists. And in one game, he would tie a club record with six assists. But more than that, Doug Gilmore provided the leadership that would turn this franchise around. Dougie Gilmore is the best hockey player in the world today. Y'all ready for this? Mr. Hockey here in Toronto. The best player I've ever played with. When your best offensive player is your best defensive player, you have what it takes to start winning. He gets himself into trouble once in a while on the A's. I never knew Toronto was this good. say is uh, thank you Cliff and thanks to fans of Toronto because it's been a, a great year and a half for me with, uh, with my new team. Gilmore with a break. Gilmore cutting right in a goal. Backhand scores! What a great save by Patrick. Rebound in front. Anderson rolls to the net. Scores! Oh! Swirling. Oh, he was hit by Gilmore. What a hit by Andrew Gilmore. Chuck over the Winnipeg line. Oh! LeFave gets an uppercut. Down goes Brown. Down goes Brown. And LeFave leaves him there. TKO. 1992-93 certainly was a knockout for the blue and white. And here's the evidence. 99 points, a team record. It broke the standard set by Joe Primo's 1950-51 outfit. The 44 wins surpassed by three, the previous club best. The Leafs made Maple Leaf Gardens an uncomfortable spot for visitors. Something different from past seasons. 25 wins established a new club high. 
And finally, defense. 241 goals allowed, second best in the league. All great achievements. Now we feature five more, our top five for the past season. At number five, the remarkable accuracy of Dave Andrichuk. After 10 years of marksmanship in Buffalo, the Hamilton native was dealt to the Maple Leafs in early February. After scoring 29 goals for the Sabres, Andrichuk recorded 25 more in Toronto. Many opponents tried many ways of stopping the Leafs' scoring ace, but his career-best 50th goal could not be denied. It came March 23rd in Winnipeg. Barahowski to center. Barahowski into the zone. Drop pass Gilmore to Andrichuk. Shooting scores! Dave Andrichuk hits the 50 mark. The third Maple Leaf player to do so. At number four, Glenn Anderson, and yet another achievement for yet another Maple Leaf future Hall of Famer. In Edmonton, no one produced better when the games counted most. Testament to his five cup rings. In Toronto, Anderson has built upon that tradition. This season, he recorded goal number 450, and then in late February, point one thousand. Getting it ahead, intercepted, Anderson pokes it free. Anderson off the line, going to the net, backhand shot, scores! Glenn Anderson with his 1,000th point. Less than a week later, the Leafs honored Glenn and his family at the Gardens for the accomplishment. Standing at number three, a season of giving for Doug Gilmore. In a year of on and off ice brilliance, Gilmore's penchant for donations for others virtually rewrote the Toronto record book. The second leap to record 100 points, he set new standards for assists. In Edmonton in late March, Killer broke the club record for points in a single season, ending the year with a remarkable 127. But one February Saturday is our choice for number three on the list. Facing Minnesota on the 13th, Gilmore looked to tie the team record for most helpers in one game. The previous record was set by Babe Pratt in the 40s, but tied by 93 in 93. It gets through, and Doug Gilmore looks for that record tying assist as he hits the line. Gilmore dishes it off, Ellen the shot scores! Number six for Doug Gilmore ties the leap record. Number two on our list occurred the night after Gilmore's brilliance. Valentine's Day saw Darren Puba make a rare appearance in the Leaf goal in the return match at the Met Center against the Stars. With Felix Potbaugh on the bench, Puba's teammates left him virtually defenseless as Minnie built up a 5-2 lead and looked certain to rebound from a very sluggish Saturday. But from then on, a comeback of epic proportions, one that would be repeated many times later in the springtime. With a playoff spot on the line, Toronto stormed back. Mark Osborne made it 5-4 in the third. A major penalty for high-sticking Dave Andrichuk set up the tying goal and set the scene for a last-minute thriller. Behind the net for Cecil in the last minute of the third period. Cecil has Berg in front of the net. He's being worked over there by Stu Gavin. Hacking and cross-checking it to the front of the goal. They score! Todd Gill! And with 40 seconds to go, the Maple Leafs have taken a 6-5 lead. For Leaf supporters, there's not much doubt as to the highlight at the top of our list. It features Pat Burns and his memorable walk to the visitor's bench on his return to the Montreal Forum. I, I was probably the most nervous of the whole gang. They, they just looked at me and sort of said, you don't worry about it, we're going to look after this and you just tell us who's next. I think it was one of the stepping stones to show that we could be a good hockey club, and it was a lot to do with what Pat had brought to the hockey club. Flipped over the line by Cullen Clark. He shot, scores! Wendell Clark. Led by Captain Wendell Clark, several Leafs raised their performance level to match the emotion of the evening. Schneider having a tough time with it. Here's a pass to Gill. He's going in against Breezeball. Gill, scores!
Late in the game, after the Leafs had led 4 to nothing, the Habs cut the lead to 5-4, but the Leafs were able to hold on for a tremendous character builder. Leafs are going to win it. Five seconds remaining. The Canadians shoot it out to center. And this baby is over. Well, that's a huge win for Pat Burns. His players made him sweat a little to get it. It was a pretty gratifying win for me because I, I thought the players didn't go out and win it for me. We've shown you our top five moments, but there were numerous plays to highlight the Maple Leaf season. One in particular comes to mind, the final regular season home game, and Doug Gilmore is honored before the fans for both his on-ice activities and his charity work. And he also demonstrated an eerie ability to predict the future. Last but not least, thank Toronto, the fans. We're going we're gonna to do something for you guys yet, okay? Thank you. The two teams had met in the Stanley Cup playoffs on 22 occasions. The Detroit Red Wings and the Toronto Maple Leafs separated by just four points over the regular season. And we knew it was going to be a classic. The blue and white against the red and white. Families from coast to coast have gathered for over 60 years to enjoy these two rivals. Many will remember the gallant comeback of the 42 Leafs. Others will never forget hockey's immortal number nine, Gordie Howe. There's been the heroics of Bobby Bond and his goal on a broken ankle. In later years, the joy of viewing Stevie Eiserman, the wing's great captain. This year's edition opened in the Motor City on April 19th. The regular season provided us with a pretty good idea as to what type of series this would be. You could count on the fact that tempers and emotions would be raised to an all-time high. The series also matched two of the game's premier pivots, Gilmore and Iserman. On the combative side, longtime opponents Wendell Clark and Bob Probert would match muscle. Pat Burns had to wonder about a variety of things heading into game one. One would be the performance of Potvap playing in his first postseason Stanley Cup game. After the puck behind the goal, he shakes off a check. Early on, the wing saw Potvin and then challenged him in his house. Probert and Dino Cicerelli would be a constant in the crease in games one and two. So too with the wing special team. The eight-legged creature made its customary appearance in Detroit, but more of a concern for Toronto was a facial injury suffered by Nikolai Boroshevsky. It would leave the Leafs' hopes up in the air. Not dressed for game one, veteran Brad McCrimmon prepared for possible series duty. While a younger NHL hopeful, the Flyers' Ryan Sittler looked on from the stand. In the tradition of the Wings teams of the past, this one was the NHL's toughest to defend against. In game two, more pressure from Detroit. It is shot to center, a two-on-one set up led by Fedorov. Fedorov scores! Fedorov, short-handed goal. Detroit leads two to nothing. Coffee. Chase on, chase on to coffee, 
Off to the boards. Iserman Park over there. Gets a shot. Score! 3-0 Detroit! Another power play goal! The Wings built an insurmountable lead. Then the game got very nasty. Physical play that set the groundwork for a possible series turning point. Their penalty coming up against the Maple Leafs. And sticks are flying. Gloves are going. And boy, we're going to have a bit of a Donnie Brook here. The Wings left Detroit with a two-game lead. Twelve goals scored in two games as we headed to Toronto, where the fans and the team were waiting in a celebratory mood, courtesy the diverse talents of Glenn Anderson. Fireworks kicked off Game 3. Mike Illich's Red Wings knew right away that something was different about the Leafs 48 hours later. Dave Andrachuk shut out in Games 1 and 2, stood tall in Game 3. Here's Andrachuk coming in. That one stopped by Shovel Day. Leafs are on it again. I call him uh, Clyde because of the orangutan on every which way, but Lewis, he's got such long arms. I'm a guy that passes the puck. He's the guy that finishes the play. Here's Gilmore. He's alone on the rush. Two Red Wings are back, and he knew it. He has one fooled. Now he's in. Set it up. Gilmore. Backhanders to the rebound. Score. Gilmore, great rush. And then Edward Chuck gets his second. Two to nothing, Toronto. Felix Potvin then stood tall as the Wings outshot the Leafs 19 to 8 in period two. Eiserman is over the line with Drake. Eiserman gets sent to Drake. Great shot. Great save. Rebound. Great save. Back to the blue line for Coffee. Closing in. Kicked out. Rebound. Kicked out. Another save by Potvin. He made three. Somebody on the Leaf team, and it might well be Wendell Clark, has to grab the team by the throat and get him going like the way they came out and started the game. Got the puck. Pearson to the line, Marikov, no shot, center, ready to crease kick, he scores! Wendell Clark scores for the Leafs, they lead 3-1. to one. Game four on a Sunday night in Toronto. The fans, buoyed by the Leafs' efforts in Game 3, were optimistic. Norm Ullman and Paul Henderson were part of the sellout crowd. And what they saw was a throwback to the so-called good old day. This game was physical, both sides challenging the other for every inch of ice. It was all tied 2-2 in the third until Andrachuk came through again. The Leafs get it to center ice. Gilmore's there. Spun around but keeps going. Andrew Chuck taking the shot. Now the shot. Hit the center. And he scores. Andrew Chuck scores. And it's 3-2 Toronto. All night, the Wings tried to get Potva off his game. But this youngster would not budge from his game face. That's where Burns' coaching really came through. Because I remember sitting in his office the very next day and he said, you know what we do? We leave him alone. And the next game, they let Dino Cicerelli stand in front of the net and all of a sudden it just wasn't a problem anymore. Take a break. When Cliff asked me about the move, uh, should we move uh, Grand Fear? And I said, I, I think the kid can do the job. <laughs> the 
Felix's strong point is that he rebounds very quickly. Cool, Mr. Cool. Uh, he's a cool, competitive kid. He um, understands the challenge, wants the challenge. in the third, this cool cat put on a clinic and was the difference in evening the series. Hoffy with it again, 20 seconds in the penalty. Hoffy to the side of the goal. Centered in front. Racine a shot. Stopped by Pat Bell. He's got a hold of the it. The drive will pull out all the stops. And they get the puck in here. Here's a shot. And Pat Bell has it. Pat Bell has it. 11 seconds left. are going to tie the series and listen to this crowd. So it was back to the Joe Lewis Arena. The Leafs were confident after back-to-back -back wins at the Gardens, while the Wings were tense but were dominant in the first half of the game, jumping out fast and building a 4-1 lead. Red Wings on it again. Federoff going in with it. Cicerelli scores! Cicerelli! The Leafs then began a remarkable comeback, refusing to take any guff from Detroit in part led by a veteran winger whose mature guidance on and off the ice was first formulated in his hometown of Sudbury, Ontario, where he was a minor hockey hero. I think everybody uh, you know, in Northern Ontario, either you're a, a diehard Leaf fan or a diehard Canadian fan, and uh, you know, I'm definitely a diehard Leaf fan. I, I was when I was growing up. In 1991, Mike Foligno lived out that boyhood dream of playing for Toronto. Less than a year later, his dream seemed as shattered as the leg he broke. Remarkably, after therapy, Foligno returned to play a huge role for the Leafs. Heart and Solar, he's, he's the emotion of our hockey club. Foligno had his man tied up. Pushelniski is there to help. Pushelniski poking it behind the net to Clark. Clark is around the goal, gets out front, took a shot, and another drip to the high one, score! It's a goal! The Leafs have tied it on that high shot! Foligno set up Wendell Clark's tying goal in Game 5. Then in OT, he capped the comeback. Now Toronto right back in again. Clark down the left wing. Clark in front of the net. Foligno scores! Michael Foligno has scored for Toronto! The winner in overtime! The biggest goal I've ever scored, yes, and also the most exciting one. And Toronto, a tremendous comeback tonight! To see him get that, that, that type of goal was, was satisfying, gratifying for everybody. At the morning skate prior to Game 6, the Wings' focus was squarely on their captain, Steve Iserman. The focal point of their offense, Iserman, amid a flurry of rumors that he was injured, had been held off the score sheet for three straight games. The Leafs coming off that OT win in Game 5 were optimistic, but Stevie Y and his mates finally got their offense in gear, scoring six goals on special teams including two short-handed to send Felix Potvin to the bench. Darren Pupa replaced him but could do nothing to stop a 7-3 Wings win. For Game 7, Pat Burns made a key move in his lineup. Nikolai Boroshevsky returned. He went with five defensemen. There is tension in all Game 7s. This one was no different. On the ice and off, the anxiety was obvious. Here are the echoes of a classic. 
Eluding Anderson with any loss to the Gilmore. He made a good move going in on the defense and that centered it. Score! Anderson from Gilmore. And the Maple Leafs take a one nothing lead here. This goes in front and Chevrolet picked it away to Federov. He's up over the line with Primo behind him. Center of though now it's how he passed it back. Eiserman shot it back. Scramble Eiserman and down goes Potvin to somehow keep it out. He switch shot, another shot. Shovel day down and he hangs on to it. But the Leafs are coming very close. Now screen shot. Potvin didn't see it. Unfortunately, it missed the net. Waited for the score. John Burr knocked one in and the Red Wings take a 2-1 lead. Knocked the high pass down. Gilmore back to the net. It is centered. Score! Shot from the blue line. Coming in was three. Bob Rouse. And here's Clark coming in. He shoots. Rebound. Scramble for it. Borshevsky. Clark. Nobody can hit it. It's Kennedy missing it. We're seeing shot. Loose puck. front of his own net as the pass to Dilla. Great save by Potvin. The Leafs coming hard again at him. Slammed along the boards. And it's Sutter's score. The Leafs have tied again. Gilmore has scored with 2.43 left. And the game is tied. Toronto almost won the game in regulation on Peter Zezel's wraparound. But the Leafs would not be denied in OT. Rouse hammers one back in for Toronto. Clark shoving it to the corner. Out front again, Rouse. Scores! Scores! The Leafs win it! The Leafs defeat the Detroit Red Wings in overtime. Two minutes, 35 seconds in. This has been an unbelievable turn of events. The Leafs march on, and the Red Wings have been eliminated. Once that goal went in, I think a lot of feeling went in just and says, hey, this is fun, we want to continue. Gilmore to Bobby Rose, shot, scores! Nikolai Borashevsky has scored for Toronto! The Leafs win! The Leafs win! Oh, unbelievable. Out front again, Rouse! Scores! Scores! The Leafs win it! The Leafs defeat the Detroit Red Wings! The goal meant so much to all hockey fans here in southern Ontario, uh, Maple Leaf fans in particular, who waited so long for something positive to happen. Uh, uh, I think that really truly symbolized uh, the beginning of a new era. The Maple Leafs would get just one day of rest, and some 48 hours after the biggest win in 15 years in this franchise, the Maple Leafs would prepare themselves for the St. Louis Blues. And the Blues were red hot. They had eliminated the Chicago Blackhawks in four straight games. And as the Norris Division Championship was set to open, both players and fans alike had no idea what kind of test it would be of patience and perseverance. These teams had met three times in playoff history. The Blues winning in 1986. The Leafs winning the following year with Rick Lands as an overtime hero. And Brad Smith as a hometown hero. And a guy named Gilmore as their nemesis. In their last meeting in 1990, the Blues set the Leafs aside in five games. 
The teams gathered at the Gardens for Game 1. Toronto winning their first playoff series since 87, <laughs> while the Blues had just completed an eight-day layoff. Felix the Keys, Potvin, and Curtis Joseph. While we've documented Potvin, Joseph was spectacular as the Blues swept Chicago. He was the story of the playoffs in round one. Two goals in game one's first 31 minutes. John Cullen notched one on elite power play, while Philippe Bozon finished off a pretty Blues passing play. With all due respect to the cat, from then on, the show was put on by the man nicknamed Cujo. You hit the 60 shot barrier and you're going, okay. This just cannot be. A lot of times we had come to the bench and started laughing because we couldn't believe that the puck didn't go in the net. Those things do happen in the playoffs, certainly, and when you get a hot goaltender, it kind of puts a little bit of fear in you. The Leafs finally did solve Joseph in double overtime. The man who did it did so after absorbing his usual amount of punishment. Gilmore, back of the goal. Gilmore looking in front. Gilmore still with it. Gilmore trying to come out the other side. Now comes the front score! Wow! Ducky Gilmore has scored! The Leafs win it 2 to 1. With Doug Gilmore's parents in the stands, these two teams went at it again on a night when the heat made the garden stifling. The Blues, Jenny comes over the line. Jenny, great stick handler. Pass to the front of it. He scores! He found the ball somehow in front of the net and a wicked high shot over Pac Van's shoulder gives the Blues a 1 0 lead. The Leafs would tie the game later in period one. This one needed help from the video goal judge. Gilmore got credit, tied 1 1. From there, we all settled back and watched the two goalies trade miracles back and forth. Osborne takes the pass, coming in. Great save by Joseph. Pennington leading a three-man break, dropping it to Hull. Hull, stop by the Tart takes it, shoots it in there again. He got the puck loose. Remarkably, like game one, this game ended on shot 98, but the result was different. Zesel will pick it up on the board from Pearson, he missed it. And the Blues sent three away. Jandy is coming in there. Jandy gets it! Big shot, rebound, score! The Blues get the winning goal, Jeff Brown, the defenseman comes up after Putman had made two big saves. Look at the stats from 166 minutes of playoff hockey. Remember, these stats are for just two games. We then shifted to the Show Me State to see what the two teams could do for an encore. We knew that Ron Caron would be in fine form. The Leafs' job early on would be to try and solve Joseph before he could get some momentum. And they did just that. Chuck turning, goes back to Gilmore in the corner, he's out front, now coming in, centered it, and it scores! Dave Ellett makes it 2 to nothing for Toronto. But the Leafs got sloppy and allowed the Blues three goals to get back in it. In the third, Garth Butcher capitalized for the winner. Gil went after it, the Blues pick it up, Miller brings it in, Miller's sidestepping a hit. The Leafs tried late to tie it, but a mad scramble failed around Joseph. And for the first time in the series, the Blues had the lead two games to one.
Game four had a noon local start, the earliest game the Leafs had ever played, but it did not phase their energy. In fact, it was classic Leaf defense, led by a group of five underrated defenders. If there was a trophy to be given the NHL for the best defensive squad, talking about de defensemen uh, as a unit, I think Toronto Maple Leafs would run away with it. And these guys were there through thick and thin. It had its wear and tear on them, but they were so consistent. The Leafs also decided to try and do something to get Joseph off his game. It worked. They crowded him, and while it didn't produce a plethora of goals, it did produce the winner. Now it's Borshevsky again. On the boards to Gilmore. Back to the line to Gil. And Gil takes his shot. Rebound score! The Leafs take the lead as the shot came from the blue line. Their most complete game of the series. Like in Series 1, the Leafs were all tied 2-2, heading to Game 5. The Blues' game plan was no different entering this one. A tight defense employed by Coach Bob Barry, and a hope that Curtis Joseph would repeat his Toronto heroics of Games 1 and 2. It did not work. This is Gilmore, and Chuck in front. Dave Andrachuk's two goals gave him 10 playoff goals, tying a club record. There is Felino coming in. Felino going for the net. Beautiful shot. Anderson scoring on that great play by Mike Felino. And it's 5 to 1. That goal pushed Anderson past Rocket Richard on the playoff goal list, a testament to his skill. One of the best all-time flakes, but a great money player. The bigger the game, the better he plays. The 5-1 final had the Leafs within one game of the Norris title. The gateway to the West, the Arch in St. Louis, welcomed the teams back to the arena for Game 6. Pat Burns was worried about his club, but early on his fears appeared needless. Brown is back. He won't clear it out of the zone. Todd Gill stopped it. A quick pass ahead. Warshevsky to the side of the net and centered. And Andrew Chuck put it up and the light is on. It's a goal. The Leafs have scored a power play goal. That goal set a new club record for most goals by a player in one playoff year. Once again, both goalies were great. Todd Van holding the Leafs in while Joseph blocked 40 Toronto shots. But the Leafs tried what Pat Burns referred to as shortcuts, and the Blues' Dave Lowry tied it. St. Louis then showed character of their own. Craig Janney would be injured on this check by Wendell Clark, but the Blues held tough and won it late. And keep the money outside. Liking prosperity, the Leafs would need a win in Game 7 to capture their first and the last Norris Division title. The atmosphere was electric on a Saturday in May as Game 7 approached. The first Game 7 at Maple Leaf Garden since 1964 when Andy Bathgate scored the cup winner. Early on, the Leafs simply blasted the Blues away. This one was no contest. Hill takes over. Gill slides a pass in there on the right side and gets it handed back. Hammers it and he missed the goal. Rebound, score! Andrew Chuck scores! It is Gilmore and Clark. Clark takes the puck, gets away from Giles. Clark centered it. Score! 2-0 Toronto. Marshalneski and Anderson coming in. Anderson in center. Score! Marshalneski and Anderson. And a beautiful play. It is Anderson up to Clark. He's home alone. 
Home Alone scores! With past Leaf greats looking on from their alumni box, the crowd watched as Captain Wendell Clark continued the Toronto siege on Curtis Joseph. away from Lowry. A pass to Gilmore. He's going in on goal. He scores. Gilmore. Six. Nothing. Toronto. That goal by Gilmore gave him another notch in the club record book, passing Daryl Sittler. As the clock counted down, the architect came down to pay his tribute to a 6 nothing win. Here in Toronto, they they've they've suffered for a long time, and and, and to win that division was something. It was uh, something not only in Toronto but across Canada. I think a lot of people have, have now said, "Well, you see all these old Maple Leaf fans that come out of the closet all of a sudden and, and become." And that's what we wanted to do. We we wanted to bring back the pride in the Maple Leaf. Next up, the Leafs would face a man who knew all about that mystique, growing up only a few miles from Maple Leaf Gardens. I've never played a playoff game there. I was there one time for a playoff game when I was about uh, 14 or 15 years old. I just snuck in and had a standing room ticket uh, to watch the Leafs play the Flyers. But, um, you know, th this will be exciting. Impressive? You bet. The Maple Leafs among the final four of the National Hockey League, heading to the Campbell Conference Final against Wayne Gretzky and the Los Angeles Kings. The city was going hockey mad. Toronto once again was a hockey town. Gretzky looking for his fifth cup and the Kings first, and the Maple Leafs looking to win their first Campbell Conference championship. And as we got set for game one in Toronto, it appeared that all of North America was watching. Brody slapped at it. It's uh -oh. knocked down by Zezel. Zezel center one. Pretty free. And he went on blue. Pass to center to Gilmore. He falls. The shot the puck in. And Ellen gets a pussy Where's the chance for Kishore? Stick save. Rebound. 31. Great touch by save on the five. Five. Kathy, back it up. Kings, who dress seven defensemen, are playing five. Water's not seeing much ice. Puck back to the net, and Gilmore in there. It'll come off the boards to Rouse. Slides it past, and they score! Gilmore tapped it in after Rouse shot it from the blue line. One to nothing, Toronto. This series was to be a matchup of Wayne Gretzky versus Doug Gilmore. 93 got the Leafs up early, while 99 set up Pat Conacher for the tying marker. Later, Gilmore took over, playing what Harry Neal called the best six minutes of hockey he'd ever seen. Watch it right here. After the pass, Gilmore way down low. Perfectly legal. Gilmore got the pass and goes in with Clark. Clark on a steep angle, couldn't shoot it. Center, Anderson, yes! Anderson! Two, 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 two. Gilmore would notch four third period points to end the evening, or so we thought. And Gilmore, the Leafs coasting home to victory here in game one. Anderson comes in, Gilmore was hit inside the line by McSorley, and this is going to draw Clark and McSorley into a rocket. They're going, throwing punches, oh, Clark is nailing McSorley, now McSorley comes back. Our best player was laying on the ice and and hadn't got up yet. Had he got up right away, we'd have continued the play, but he uh, hadn't got up, so I thought he was more hurt than he was, and, and so I just uh, went over and talked to Marty. 
Boy, this is nasty feelings now. I don't know whether he's talking to L.A. King players. No, he's not. He's take, talking to Melrose. Look and out. Burns is trying Look to get out. down at Melrose. Behind the leaf bench, there's Burns telling Melrose, if you want to play that way, you're going to have to go through me too. And I feel I'm part of a team. And uh, if I could go out and help my player, I, I, I don't think I'd step on the ice and do it. But you want to do it sometimes because that's, that's the type of coach I am. That's the kind of family I want. There's everybody pulling for everybody and everybody backing up everybody. The Leafs as one stood behind Gilmore as he almost single-handedly won game number one. If Game 1 was Doug Gilmore's, the heroics of Game 2 were provided by Wayne Gretzky. The Kings' captain was on a mission. In Round 1, 99 helped the underdog Kings to wrap up Calgary in six games. In Round 2, another Kings upset. This time, Gretzky was the old 99, providing a textbook example of why he has a famous nickname. He is a great one. And if you don't have respect for what he's done for the game and what his job is, then uh, you must not like hockey that much because this guy is the best hockey player in the world. Pass gets to Gretzky at center. Gretzky shot it in. Sandstrom dangerous. Scores! Sandstrom left open and he's got that wicked, accurate shot. Barry Melrose celebrates. Wayne Gretzky creates and the series is tied 1-1. Game three played at the Great Western Forum with some great show business names on hand. Mary Hart and James Woods to name two. They saw the King's young defense take charge. Alexei Zhitnik plows into Peter Zezel, taking him out of the lineup, while Rob Blake was a tower of power. They also each scored a goal. Jitnik's goal was the winner as Pat Burns looked for answers at the Leafs bench. Game four and yet another example of this team's resilience. Predicted by many to be finished, the Leafs surprised those in attendance with a textbook performance. Two on one. It is Eastwood coming in with Pearson. Scores! Eastwood on a break can you the fake pass. Wayne Gretzky cut that lead in half with his first goal of the series. This one would also tie his idol, the immortal Gordie Howe. Each player having scored the same amount of career goals. Have a look at those numbers. The Leafs bounced right back from 99's goal as the veteran Mikes, Polino and Krujelniski teamed up for the eventual game winner. For the third series in a row, the Leafs were tied 2-2 after Game 4. May 25th was a special day for Mark and Madeline Osborne. In addition to their family, had the game taking second billing. The doctor assured us that it would be delivered uh, by 7 o'clock, and, you know, he was an hour off, and it was uh, just, uh, you know, at 11.24 of the first period, I believe. But uh, there was a nurse's station right across the hall, and and uh, soon after that, I, I, you know, periodically went in to see on the TV, and and uh, you know, Crusher had scored to make it two to one. The outside, and that's Rouse playing it in there. It's tipped in, tipped in by Kushelinski, and then slide tied it up to make it two two. And by the time we went into overtime, we were all up in the in in the hospital room upstairs. Uh, you know, the three of us with, with both of our mothers watching overtime. <laughs> Anderson skating up front. Here's his shot. That's Buck Anderson scores. Anderson scores. Gets the rebound. And the Leafs win it. What a day. A berth with an eye and one game away from a Stanley Cup berth. As this series was continuing in L.A., some 2,000 miles away in the town of Kelvington, Saskatchewan, the families of Wendell Clark and Barry Melrose were watching with keen interest. The parents of both men would gather to watch the game. Back in Los Angeles, the coach could only watch as his cousin put on a classic three-goal performance. 
Close coming out, a lead pass with a good one to Clark. Clark going in and Burnaby scores! Clark against McSorley and he had Rudy up on the wrong foot. Hot man to the bench. Six attackers. Gilmore. Clark scores! Wendell Clark has scored for Toronto! Let me say yeah! As a captain, he knew that I looked upon him, uh, not vocally, but just to look in the eye to say, hey. I think he proved to, to everybody that uh, he still has the heart and soul. As the teams readied for overtime, the Kings were facing elimination, but would be on the power play early in the extra period controversy. Wayne Gretzky's stick clips the Leafs' Doug Gilmore in the face. He's cut, but there's no penalty. 99 gets a reprieve. And under a minute later, scores the game winner. Yet another Game 7 in the offing. Here's the words that went with some great pictures. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Game 7 of the Campbell Conference Final. Gretzky coming in with McSorley. McSorley to Gretzky. He scores! Gretzky and McSorley on the return pass. And that's a shorthanded goal. McSorley and Gretzky again. Gretzky takes the pass. In front, Sandstrom scores! Sandstrom from Gretzky, and it's 2-0 LA. 35 seconds left in the penalty. Gilmore and Enrichuk. Enrichuk going for the net. He's around the goal. Sander Clark scores! Wendell Clark! And the Leafs get a power play goal. And that's a big goal for the Maple Leafs. It's Gilmore trying to shake loose. He's caught in the corner. Millen all over him. Gilmore trying to kick it loose. Now he does. And he gets a pass in front. Anderson. It is tied. Gretzky grabs it. Into Sandstrom. And Sandstrom back to Gretzky. Gretzky scores. Gretzky gets the pass. And blasts one by Putfan. And Gilmore trying to set up Wendell Clark. Gilmore again. Clark scores. Clark has tied it. to Granado, who's in there for L.A. Here's Shednick. That shot a rebound. Goal! The Kings Donnelly Park at the side of the net. Pat Burns gathered his club together in the game's final minute after the teams had just exchanged two goals. Gretzky made it 5-3, banking it in off Dave Ellett. But the Leafs' Ellett scores quickly to make it 5-4. Setting the stage for a wild finish. Here's Gilmore coming out. Ten seconds left. The crowd in a frenzy. And it's Rouse. It'll come out over the line. And the LA Kings are going to win it. Two seconds left. And the Kings have won it. And they go on to meet the Montreal Canadiens. And a heartbreaking loss for the Maple Leafs tonight. We had played 21 games and 41 nights. And... Our players couldn't have been asked to do any more than they did. From the start of the year, I thought uh, we didn't have a, a highly flashy hockey club, but we had a, a club that came to work with their work boots and, and, and their lunch box every day. I thought it all the way, but to the end, and I wanted to make sure everybody knew that, that I was, uh, I had never been prouder than, than a hockey club in my whole coaching career. You've got to move it.